3.30 on Talk Radio. It's Thursday. I'm Daryl Morris. You know the drill. Thursday mornings, we like to head to the movies and have a look what's on the big screen over the weekend. Um, lots and lots of stuff to get our teeth into right now with uh, one of our film men, Van Connor. Van, hello, good morning. And a hello to you as well, Daryl. How are you? Oh, I can't complain. I've had better weeks cinematically, but uh, there's at least one gem for us this week around. Okay, good. Yeah, it feels a bit, it just feels a little bit flat at the moment. Well, it's coming up to Christmas. You know, we've got uh, Jumanji next week. We've got Star Wars the week after that. We've got Cats sometime in between. So, you know what? We've got good stuff to come. We can have a quiet one. Okay. Quiet before the storm. Um, so. Let's start off with Honey Boy then, shall we? Because this, uh, this one looks like, uh, of, of the ones that we've got, this one looks like the one that could be the best, in my mind. This It looks like the quirkiest, definitely. And I suppose in, in one sense it is. So this is uh, this has been written by Shia LaBeouf, who also stars in it. And it is uh, it's a sort of fictionalised take on his own life story, specifically focusing on his relationship with his dad, who he actually plays in the film. So Shia LaBeouf effectively plays his own dad in what might be the greatest exercising of one's own daddy demons you've ever seen (laughs) on a a cinema screen. Um, And we get to see him played in his adult years by Lucas Hedges and in his sort of tween years by uh, by Noah Jupe. And it it chronicles the relationship in the between years between uh, Noah Jupe's younger incarnation and Shia LaBeouf's dad, and uh, in the older years as Lucas Hedges goes off to rehab to work out the sort of resulting issues that have come out of this this unorthodox upbringing in motels surrounded by hookers, drugs and alcoholics. I've got a clip for you of just what the dynamic between father and son is like. I'm looking for one of those nines, please. No can be. Jen. No, you did Jim. No, you did not. Fifth and you had the six. God damn. I knew it, too. I knew you had it. I knew it. I saw it. I saw it on your face. Put it down. 86. I'm getting better. Learning to lie. Yeah, well, you lie for a living, poop butt. We all do. I don't. Hey. No, sir. You lie. I'm telling you, I'm a lot of things. A liar's not one of them, buddy. Okay. It, yeah, it's, 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 it's a little bit... Uh, now, let's just say it's uh, one of the more uh, fanciful dramas, we shall say. Put it this way, if, if this actually is based on any kind of truth, it would go some ways to explaining why Shia LaBeouf is such an insufferable tool. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that would be to put it that would be to put it mildly. I think Noah Jupe as the younger incarnation, the character is called Otis, by the way, not Shia, noticeably. Uh, the uh, younger actor Noah Jupe, I, I saw recently in uh, Le Mans '66, and I'm sure your producer Johnny there will be nodding his head in excitement at the mere mention of that film because it was great and he was great in it. Um, I think Lucas Hedges is also always terrific. He's, you know, he's Lucas Hedges. He's doing what Lucas Hedges does. There's a great little performance from uh, Martin Starr in there as well. Um, But, you know, really, it's a showpiece for Shia LaBeouf. I mean, go figure. The man wrote himself the best role in the movie. Mm. But... It, it is a film that you do think screams of one's own self mythologizing. It's nicely enough directed by the the music uh, music video director Alma Harrell. It, it's not going to have much in the way of mainstream appeal though, and I think if you uh, if you got taken to this as a date movie on a Saturday night, there wouldn't be a second date. Put it that way. Really? Right? Okay. All right. He. I mean, look, this is this isn't um, overly new from Shia LaBeouf though. We're we're, we're very used to the sort of self indulgent uh, pieces um, <laughs> of of not even just movie, but of art as well that he that he creates and the sort of circus that he creates around himself oh very much and i say if there's any truth to this story we can now make some degree of sense <laughs> out of that definitely yeah fair enough um okay w- worth worth a watch though at least or not so much the performances make it worthwhile, and there are a couple of really hearty laughs in there. You do know where it's going, though, from beginning to end. You, you know exactly how this is going to play out. And as soon as, because obviously I had forgotten that this was meant to be Shia LaBeouf's biographical movie, and as soon as that moment clicks, you just think, oh, God, I know where this is going. Right. It's also... Uh, 
cast a very interesting uh, look on uh, the making of the movie Constantine, if you really want to read between the lines. Right, okay. But performance-wise from him, is it, is it, is it up there? Does he do it? I mean, I mean, I mean, in, f- in fairness to him, as much as he is a sort of self-indulgent tool, uh, taking on the role of your own father, um, as much as that is possibly the, the most sort of self-indulgent, inward-looking thing that you can do, um, beyond taking on the role of yourself, I guess. Does he, <laughs> does he do it justice? Is he good at it? Is it a good performance? It is a good performance. I will give him that, but it does I say it does scream of, of you know the insertion of unnecessary grandeur. You do think like, like I feel like you have added an awful lot of philosophy to this that can't possibly have been there. Right. <laughs> okay, then fair enough. Um, elsewhere, then Lucy in the Sky. Any better? So Lucy in the Sky is, believe it or not, actually worse. Oh, God. So, right. <laughs> don't worry, we are building to a good one, I promise. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, this is uh, directed by Noah Hawley. It is loosely based on, do you remember back in about 2006, there was a female astronaut who went to space, came back to Earth, and then kidnapped one of her fellow astronauts, went mad, and it was all to do with having an affair with one of her, uh, with, with one of her male colleagues? Yes. Right, this is the fictionalised version of that. Right. Brought to us, brought to us by the man responsible for the, uh, for, for the Fargo TV series and that weird X-Men spin-off show Legion. Yeah. Right. So this stars Natalie Portman as Lucy. For the purposes of the, uh, of the movie, she's re- renamed Lucy Cola because that's apparently a plausible human being's name. Right. <laughs> uh, she goes to space at the beginning of the film. She stares at the earth. She's taken in by the wonder and the rapture of her station in the universe, how everything is just so small and we are but specks in the greater cosmos. She returns to earth after this sort of transcendence experience, transcendent experience, and she just finds that she can't reconnect with humanity. Her marriage doesn't have the same appeal, you know, the same connection that it used to have. She, the, only, uh, the only tangible sort of relationship she can form are with other astronauts who have been to space and who share the same experience, as you will hear in this clip. You know how it is. You go up there, you see everything. The whole universe. And everything here looks so small. We're so small. And then you splash down, what, you go to Applebee's, you know, Monday Night Football, clip your toenails, and all you can think about is, when can I go back? Okay, this immediately strikes me that this is trying too hard. Well, I mean, to be honest, I I could feasibly call this Interstellar, but uh, it would be a waste of a really good pun on a film that, frankly, doesn't put that much effort in. It's gorgeous to look at. I've got to give it that. There's uh, there's a bit of an overuse of bird's eye view footage to the extent that there are times when I really genuinely felt like I was watching an HD port of the first Grand Theft Auto game. <laughs> but beyond that, there's got a terrific performance from Natalie Portman. You can't deny that this is a hell of a concept for a movie. Just the unraveling of this. World. Woman. And, uh, you know, there's a great supporting cast in there, which is like Ellen Burstyn, John Hamm, Zazie Beetz, Dan Stevens, Jeffrey Dunham, and Tig Notaro. Um, you know, there's, oh, uh, Nick Offerman. Nick Offerman turns up in this, and I'm always very happy to see Nick Offerman, you know, doing drama. The problem is, the film is not very good. It's ponderous, navel-gazing bilge. It doesn't seem to know what its greater point is, and I mean, as I say, the concept is there, you know, the, the existentialism, the, the the effect that being in space can have, the, the the reality that so many people who have, you know, walked on the moon, for instance, have had serious substance abuse problems, have had breakdowns, things like that. There is a wealth of material there to delve into. This is not the film that's going to do it. Right, OK. What what could they have done to make it better then, Van? Because as you say, all of those themes, the themes that it challenges, sound fascinating, absolutely gripping to me. What you've got is a, a film in which there, I mean, there really are no characters. There are simply monologues. Uh, you know what I mean? There's, there, there are no yeah. human emotions. There's simply you know, the extillation of what feels like dramatic readings, you know, for the purpose of purely dramatic readings. It feels like this simply needed another pass at the script, simply to, you know, have any of the characters resemble human beings rather than these, uh, you know, these towering dramatic titans that they 
uh, they seem to think they're portraying instead. I guess I, there's, there's stuff in there. I, I love the cast. I think the cast is great. The moment Jeffrey Donovan turns up in anything, I'm always happy. And also, I always want to immediately go and revisit the series Burn Notice, which I can tell you any given episode of which is infinitely more interesting and entertaining than Lucy in the Sky. Um, the guy who's directed this, incidentally, Noah Hawley, has just landed the job uh, direct, writing and directing the fourth Star Trek movie for, for Paramount. On the back of this film, it is nearly impossible to see how. Okay. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, good luck with that, then. Um, okay, I feel like we're, we're, we're building up to something, then, Van. We're building up to something very, very special. This, this has got to be box office, my friend. Unfortunately, it's not box office gold, but it is quite special, I think. It's a film called Ordinary Love. Uh, this is uh, written by uh, Owen McCafferty. It's directed by uh, Lisa barris Desar and Glenn Laban, and it stars Liam Neeson and Leslie Manville. And there's, there's no there's no frills on this. It's a, a sort of a kitchen sink slice of life drama chronicling the life of uh, you know a middle aged married couple. They've lost their daughter to tragedy some years uh, earlier. Their adult daughter. Daughter. And uh, in this in this uh, this point in their lives, Leslie Manville you know, uh, finds a lump that she qu- quickly goes gets checked out. Is determined to be breast cancer, and this is about the toll that this takes on their relationship. The cracks that start to form in their otherwise you know perfectly content marriage, and just just the the crushing weight that it brings down on them. I've got a clip for you of the 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 the, the, the early discussion of just what kind of a change this is going to make for them. What's going to happen if I've got cancer? There's no point in saying it like that, no. You don't know. You can't do anything until you know. I know. I know I've got it. So you're a doctor now? You don't have to be a doctor to know things like that. Yes, you do. I know that three is closer to five, and I know I've got breast cancer. Okay. Well, what are you going to do now? Correct. Because you can't do anything because you don't know. Well, that's not an answer. Nice. Quite, just quite subtle. It that's the thing. The word is subtlety, definitely. It's thoughtful, it's considered, it's grounded, it's great. It's not big, it's not flashy, it's not trying to reinvent the wheel. What it wants to do is give you a really heartfelt and sincere script to give you two absolutely terrific performances, combine those into a film that, okay, sure, it's, it, you know, it's nothing you haven't seen, for instance, uh, visually at least, or stylistically, in the form of a, you know, a made-for-ITV movie on Thursday night at nine o'clock. Mm. But it is, it's going to say, it, it's been written in such a way that, to, to put it in one sense, um, at one point I, I did look around the screening room watching this and there was a very visible telltale sign that indicates literally anybody who's ever been through this experience, who's, who's experienced this firsthand, who's you know, had someone close to them face a battle with cancer or done it themselves because the tears were streaming. Mm. The, the, there were, there were awkward, awkward laughs in there, you know, just uh, to go with the realities. Like the, you know, the idea that in these, in these situations, you have to have that little bit of realistic, you know, real world brevity. And it has that. It will have you ugly crying and laughing in equal measure. So Liam Neeson, who it, it seems weird to me that we kind of forget of as a dramatic actor now because we're so used to him as, you know, sort of schlocky actioner. Um, it, it's nice to see him in back in something more ground. And Leslie Manville is always terrific. But as I say, it is all about that chemistry between them and it is all about Owen McCafferty's script. I thought this was a genuinely beautiful film. It's the best film out this week for me by a country mile. Yeah. But it's it's a film that I think if you have a personal connection as well, you're you'll definitely find, uh, you know, something in there to anchor on to that you wouldn't perhaps find otherwise. I think it's just a genuinely terrific film. Though. Yeah, well, especially when you contrast it with uh, Lucy in the Sky and Honey Boy, these things that are, tr- that are, that are trying really hard to be uh, to be really lofty um, in, in a way that Ordinary Love clearly doesn't. That's it, that's it. And there is that there is that lack of trying, that lack of extraneous effort. Like, we don't need to literally take this to the stars we can find a perfectly compelling and heartfelt story right here on the ground. And, and Ordinary Love really proves that point. Um, just two, two points on the cast. Uh, firstly, Leslie Manville. Um, nice to see um, an, an older female in a lead, you know, smashing it. 
<laughs> uh, absolutely. I mean, Leslie Manville, you know, she, I mean, she, I think I saw her recently in, uh, was it the Maleficent sequel? I think she's one of the fairies, the Maleficent sequel recently. Mm. But, uh, of course, you know, her big thing in the last few years has been the Phantom Thread. Uh, with, uh, with Daniel Day Lewis. That got her some, uh, some awards buzz, I think, as well at the time. But uh, she's a terrific actress anyway. I know, uh, Josh Robb's a big fan of her, as, uh, as I found out when we saw this. Yeah. Uh, immediately got in touch. How is Leslie in it? I mean, she's, she's very good. She's <laughs> Leslie Mandel. Of course she's good. Yeah, and 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 I guess in in, in the same way Liam Neeson, although he, he's not um, exactly shy of, of of work, but but you know, two a, a, a film here that is revolving around the ordinary lives of two middle aged to older people, uh, you know, isn't something that you see every day. Uh, very much so. Actually, I mean, for one thing, the film is uh, is filmed and set in Northern Ireland. It's it's always a novelty just to see uh, Liam Neeson play Irish, mm. but uh, and also to play his age as well, which uh, yeah. seems odd. Yeah, um, I, I was always kind of well, <clears throat> sort of anticipating his career uh, stumbling slightly after the uh, debacle of the of the um, let, let's not call it racism because it wasn't necessarily that, but the the race related comment that he made. Shall we say um, at the uh, the promotion of another film, it doesn't seem to have happened. Doesn't seem to have had really much effect on 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 his employability, Van. I don't think so. I mean, he's he's Liam Neeson. I think uh, I, I mean the, the things he said at the time were idiotic, anyway. But it was it did come across to me that it was something that he just said in passing without really thinking about the uh, the weight of it or the context of it. Um, you know, I think he thought he was being profound and obviously it was quite idiotic, but uh, you know, Liam Neeson is a terrific actor. I think he will always be a terrific actor and I think he will never lack for work no matter what he says. Um, Van, thank you, my friend. Always a pleasure. Um, you, so, so we're like on the cusp of some big, I don't know if we, we'll probably be with, uh, catching up with John next week, but you'll be, you'll be around on talk radio. I always like to hear you with Jamie at the weekends, um, and, and across the schedule, uh, on talk radio. But, um, uh, Jumanji, you say, Star Wars as well on the horizon? Uh, we have, and uh, of course, you know, it's that time of year when they have to put Elf back in cinemas as well, so uh, <laughs> there's there's that to look forward to. I don't know about you, but I uh, I have to get my Elf fix every year. I will tell you as well, there is a film out this Friday called The Cave, a documentary about uh, a literal underground hospital in Syria, and uh, genuinely harrowing, heartbreaking documentary absolutely worth seeing this it just chronicles the lives of these genuine heroes who volunteer as hospital staff in a war zone uh that is absolutely worth seeing uh the remake of black christmas is out next week as well uh we've also got uh pink wall that's that's meant to be very good i've not i'm looking forward to watching that myself this next week uh and of course i can say cats which uh is not without its controversy. We shall, we shall see that. And uh, the remake of Little Women, we've got uh, Playing With Fire, the John Cena firefighter comedy out on Boxing Day as well. And uh, <laughs> the new Will Smith animated project, Spies in Disguise, in which a spy is turned into a pigeon, which oh. I shall be seeing this Sunday. Oh, why is Will Smith making such bad decisions at the moment, Van? Why? Because he learnt nothing from Shark Tale. That's why. <laughs> but great, I just, want to, I just want to grab him and shake him. Come on, Will, you're better than this. Um, Van, listen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, my friend. We'll catch up again soon. Till the next time, good sir. Van Connor, our film man on Talk Radio this morning.